Good morning. Uh, this morning's lecture is entitled Gold, Money and Gold in the 1920s and 1930s, Defending the Rothbardian Position. Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression, uh, was published in 1963, um, which was a year after, I believe, the publication of Milton Friedman's book, Monetary History, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's book, A Monetary History of the United States. Uh, in, in Friedman's book, he tried to rehabilitate the quantity theory. And in particular, he tried to use it to show how the Great Depression was caused by a deflation of the money supply. That was completely um, unjustified, and that was engineered by the Fed. And that the prior decade, decade, the 1920s, was in fact not an inflationary decade at all. So that absent the Fed's deliberate decrease or contraction of the money supply, there would have been at most a, a small and short recession in 1929 and 30 that would have um, rapidly turned around into a recovery, as occurred in 1920-21. So Friedman was, at this point, attempting to get this view accepted by the mainstream. Okay. The mainstream accepted the Keynesian view that it was a collapse in the marginal of efficiency of capital, marginal efficiency of capital, uh, or in other words, uh, in investment spending, <clears throat> and also consumer spending and, and uh, an attempt to reduce the deficit that caused the uh, Great Depression. And Friedman was attempting to get his monetary explanation of the Great Depression ex um, accepted. And this was really um, the beginning of, of, the, of the monetarist counter-revolution against Keynesian economics the appearance of, of this book. Now Rothbard comes along and writes a book that's also free market, that's also anti-Keynesian, and that gives a radically divergent explanation of what went on in the 1920s. For Rothbard, the 1920s was extremely, well, it was indeed inflationary, and why the, the, the depression resulted in the 1930s. Uh, even um, more irritating to Friedman, he argues that the Fed was actually attempting to inflate the money supply, though unsuccessfully, in the early 1930s. So the, the, the monetarists have always, from the beginning, attempted to either discredit or marginalize um, Rothbard's America's Great Depression by ignoring it. Okay. But every once in a while, uh, a monetarist will comment on it, and the comments are usually the same. First, somehow Rothbard contrived a, 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 a definition of the money supply that made the 1920s appear to be an inflationary decade in order to apply the Austrian theory of the business cycle to the explanation of the Great Depression. Uh, and secondly, they also claim that Rothbard invented um, a... Um, view that the Fed was not try, trying to deliberately deflate the money supply or contract the money supply in the 1930s. Okay. And this all came to a head, okay, but by the way, these, these generally were off-the-cuff off remarks. They, they were, weren't written down anywhere. Okay. Um, many Austrians um, actually accepted these monetarist criticisms of Rothbard's book, believe it or not. Okay. Yes, Rothbard suddenly came up with this very broad measure of the money supply, which in no way um, reflected the um, realities of the medium of exchange. And um, so Austrians tended to say, you know, accept that. Because Rothbard did include, as we'll, as we'll see, um, life insurance uh, net policy reserves, basically the amount of, of cash that someone could cash out by borrowing against his or her life in, in insurance policy. And also the fact that the money supply did decline severely in the early 1930s um, makes it uh, a little strange or, or makes it um, um, dubious that 
the um, appeared dubious that the, Fed, that the Fed was actually trying to inflate the money supply. Isn't the Fed all powerful? Okay, can't the Fed simply increase the money supply, you know, ad libitum or at will? So, as I grew up in the Austrian movement, I would I would hear these criticisms of Rothbard, and I would see that that some of my colleagues maybe um, would would accept these criticisms that Rothbard really went too far. In, in trying to apply the uh, Austrian business cycle theory. So uh, we have a, a, a bill of, of uh, or a um, set of criticisms advanced in 1999 by Richard Timberlake in the Freeman, and I responded to these criticisms. Uh, he wrote three articles, a trilogy of articles, in which he criticized Rothbard, and he also criticized some of the Fed and Treasury policies. And I actually defended all three. I actually defended the Fed in at least one of its policies and the Treasury in one of its policies in my response. So what I'd like to do is to, is, is to go over that debate. Let me just start by showing you uh, Timberlake's particular criticisms of Rothbard, okay, in his own words. He says first that um, Rothbard has contrived a new and unacceptable, or invented a new and unacceptable meaning for the term inflation. <laughs> Secondly, that he contrived the definition of the money supply to invent a Fed-orchestrated inflation of the 1920s. Uh, thirdly, that um, Rothbard somehow mismeasured the central bank's monetary data. And lastly, that Rothbard misunderstood the nature and operation of the pseudo-gold standard that was controlled by the Fed uh, after 1933. Okay. So I want to defend Rothbard on these points. Timberlake also goes on in these three articles, and I'll, I'll touch on this, to say that the U.S. Treasury's policy of neutralizing gold inflows, um, as well as the Fed's policy of, of sharply increasing reserve requirements in the mid-1930s, um, led to uh, or Im aborted an economic recovery that was just beginning, okay, and it resulted in a recession within the Depression, the recession of 1937-38. Uh, okay, so I'll comment on that also. So as I said, um, Timberlake begins by claiming that Rothbard proceeds on, 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 on a new and unacceptable definition of inflation, meaning that Rothbard made this up. It, 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 by, by, by expressing it in this manner, you would think, well, no one else in the, in the history of economic thought has ever used this type of, of definition of inflation. Um, well, let me start with that point. Okay. Rothbard's definition was simply that the increase in the money, uh, that, that inflation occurred when there was an increase in the money supply not consisting in, not covered by, that is, an increase in gold, okay, and those are his words, okay. But as I show in, in, in my response, this is really an old and, 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 and a venerable um, definition, okay. This definition uh, developed out of the controversies between the currency school, the good guys, the sort of proto-Austrians, and the British banking school, okay, proto-Keynesians, in the mid-19th century. Basically, according to the currency school, which, uh, which triumphed uh, temporarily in the debate, uh, the gold standard was not enough to prevent inflations and, and, and recessions. Great Britain had gone back to a gold standard in 1821, um, and yet it had been plagued with the business cycle. Well, what the currency school point out, pointed out was this. If commercial banks were permitted to... Um, operate on fractional reserves to lend out a part of their depositors' um, money, what would occur would be uh, an increase in the money supply. That is, we would have fiduciary media, unbacked notes and deposits. And that would drive up prices in Great Britain. And as prices rose in Great Britain, uh, British citizens would begin to shift their purchases to foreign products, increasing imports. At the same time, since gold prices were higher in Great Britain, foreigners would reduce their purchases from Great Britain, causing exports to fall. So you get a budget that, uh, you would get um, a, a balance of trade 
or balance of payments deficit in Great Britain. And the way this would be paid for would be by gold flowing out. Okay? The people who had to make purchases abroad or had to, had to, had to finance their purchases abroad would, would, would take their British pounds, their paper pounds or, 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 their, or their, their deposits, and go to the banks and turn them in for gold. So gold would begin to flow out of the country. Okay? The banks at that point would become a little panicky. Uh, they would be worried that there would be an internal drain developing as a result of the external drain. The external drain is, is gold flowing out of the country. As people saw this, they would get nervous about being able to redeem their notes and deposits, and therefore there would be the threat of bank runs, which is the internal drain. That is, uh, British citizens would attempt to withdraw even more gold okay, uh, by converting their, their, their bank liabilities. So to prevent this, what regularly happened was that the banks then would reverse their policy, they would cut back on their loans, um, the, the money supply would fall, and there would be a decline in prices in Great Britain. And with this decline in prices, you would have deflation and, and, and depression. Okay. Eventually, gold would flow back into the country because of the lower British prices uh, as the money supply shrunk, and you would, um, you would have a, a recovery eventually occurring, but then the banks would begin the same cycle again, because they want to earn interest. So as, 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 as deposits flow back into the bank, they would then engage again in injecting fiduciary media into the uh, economy, raising prices, and starting the cycle over again. So what was the currency school's policy recommendation? What they said was, well, let's, we can prevent this, okay? We have to go beyond the gold standard. We have to prevent banks from issuing notes Okay, in, in particular, the Bank of England, um, beyond the amount of gold that they held. Okay? Now, this was a marginal rule. What they said was any note that was issued had to be backed by a, the full face value in terms of gold. In, in other words, what they Im wanted implemented was a, a marginal 100% rule. Every expansion in the, in the supply of notes in the economy would reflect gold flowing in to the banks from abroad, okay? Or people depositing gold in the banks. So n no new note, unbacked note, would ever be put into circulation again. And they got this passed, okay? Unfortunately, it didn't stop the inflationary booms or the, re or the um, ensuing recession depressions, okay? Well, why not? Well, unlike uh, the American currency school, who followed uh, the, the, the British Currency School, um, they did not, or they neglected to, or, uh, or, or ignored the fact that bank deposits, checking account money, were, was also part of the money supply. And therefore, that this marginal 100% rule should also apply to checking deposits. So what the banks did then was to inflate the supply of checking account money in the economy. Okay? That is, increase or inject fiduciary media, unbacked um, money substitutes by loaning, not notes, but by, by increasing deposits, by loaning money out through increasing deposits. Okay. And as a result, we were stuck with this, um, uh, or, or, or British, Britain continued to, to suffer from the business cycle. Now, during the brief period when the currency school triumphed, during the period when the, 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 um, the act that implemented this law was passed, people began to use inflation according to the currency school uh, definition, which was, uh, use the term inflation as, as the currency school defined it. That is, an increase in the money supply that exceeded the amount or increase in, in gold. Okay. So one, one American financial writer um, Charles Holt Carroll, who was a, a, an American currency school writer, he wrote that the source of inflation and of the commercial crisis is in the nature of the system which pretends to lend money but creates currency by discounting such bills when there is no such money in existence. Okay. So he went on to say, instead of using gold and silver for currency, they are merely used as a basis of the greatest possible inflation by the banks. So it was, he said it was the artificial increase of currency only, meaning the amount of currency that was put into circulation beyond the, uh, the, the, the gold stock that 
was causing the problem of inflation and then later depression. Okay. Um, and then in the last quarter of the um, 19th century, the greatest American monetary theorist, um, Francis A. Walker, also believed that inflation was an inherent feature of the issue of, of even convertible banknotes, banknotes that could be converted into um, end deposits. Okay. Um, these convertible banknotes and deposits that could be converted into gold, um, if they were issued beyond the stock of gold, if you had fractional reserves uh, banking resulting uh, or that, that was um, in, in, in place, then, in his words, there resides in bank money, even under the most stringent provisions for convertibility, the capability of local and temporary inflation. So what he was saying was that um, even where banks stood ready to convert these notes and deposits into gold, because they were issuing these notes and deposits beyond the stock of gold that they held, um, you, you would get inflation. So this is not a new and invented definition by Rothbard. Okay? It was the older definition of, of inflation. Um, on the other hand, when the, banking, when, the, when the currency school was discredited by the continuing business cycles, again, because of, 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 of the defect in their policy, which did not apply the 100% um, marginal reserve rule to, uh, uh, to checking account money, uh, then the banking school, their opponents, their definition of inflation came into play. It still referred to the money supply. Okay? It didn't yet refer to uh, just an increase in prices. But their definition was that inflation was an increase in the money supply, not beyond the stock of gold in the banks, but beyond the needs of trade. Okay? So if somehow there were more people that um, were trading, that, according to the banking school, would be reflected in the fact that more um, borrowers would come to the banks, more business borrowers, demanding loans. And that the, the banks had the right then to discount these loans or had the, the duty to discount these loans and that would not be uh, or to discount these bills that they were being given, or increase the loans, and that this would not be inflationary. So that in, uh, definition of inflation began to replace the currency school uh, Rothbard um, definition. And what was pointed out uh, uh, according, uh, um, by, by opponents of the, of the banking school is that the banking school could, could increase the needs of trade as much as it wanted. It could just simply lower the interest rate. The lower the interest rate, the more businesses would want to borrow. Okay. So the banking school would say, well, look, um, businesses are coming to, to the banks and they want to borrow. So we have, you know, because they want to borrow, that means that the, their needs of trade have expanded and it, 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 it's proper to... to um, to, to fulfill those, those needs by increasing lending. But all this did was to drive up the money supply okay, and cause inflation. So I, to, 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 um, to conclude this here, um, Rothbard's theory surely is not new, and to say that it is unacceptable is simply to express one's agreement with the preference for the banking school over the, the currency school definition. By the way, the banking school definition that inflation was an increase in the money supply beyond the needs of trade was one step away from the modern definition that inflation is simply an increase in prices. Because the American quantity theorists later on, okay, Irving Fisher, um, uh, Edwin Kemmerer, who were early quantity theorists in the United States, they basically said that inflation occurs whenever the country's circulating media, and by that they meant money and deposit currency, increase relative to the needs of trade. Okay? Because when they went beyond the needs of trade, they drove prices up. So it was a short step in the 1930s to then redefine inflation as simply an increase in prices. Okay. Now, Timberlake also challenged Rothbard's statistical definition of the money supply on two grounds. First, Rothbard included savings and loan share capital. Okay? There were institutions, savings and loans, that were owned by their depositors. Okay. So when you went and, and deposited money into a savings and loan, you were not given a checking account or you were not told that you were a depositor. You were a shareholder. Okay. Now that meant that in some sense you were, you, you were an owner. So that was the first <laughs> thing that Timberlake objected to. Now secondly, um, Rothbard also included um, 
the, the life insurance net policy reserves. So, Timberlake claimed that Rothbard included these two items in the money supply as a way of trying to make the 1920s look like a more inflationary decade than it really was. Okay? And he went on to argue, Timberlake did, that uh, the two items in question are not money because they cannot be spent on ordinary goods and services. To spend them, one needs to cash them in for other money, that is, currency or bank drafts. Okay, so let me take these one, one at a time. First, the share accounts offered by savings and loan associations were fixed at one dollar. Okay, so if you, if you put a dollar into your, into your account, then you got one dollar of a share in the savings and loan. Okay, um, but they were back then and always have been, okay, even uh, until through the 1980s, we had um, savings and loan associations that were owned by their depositors and issued share accounts and savings and loan associations that were um, owned by stockholders and they issued savings accounts. But economically, the accounts were exactly the same, okay? In both cases, whether it was a share account or a savings account, you could withdraw your money on demand at par. So if you, so if you, if you had $10,000 worth of shares in a savings and loan, okay, you could immediately withdraw that. In fact, um, the, uh, the, sh the savings and loan associations were contractually obligated to repurchase their shares at par upon the request of the shareholder. But they could legally delay the, re the repurchase. They could legally delay it, okay? Just as, 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 as savings and loans could, could legal other savings and loans, the non, um, um, uh, the, the, the savings and loans that issued only savings accounts, they could del delay it too by, by insisting on 30 days notice. Neither institution, neither type of savings and loan institution ever or, or to any extent insisted on, on um, no, uh, previous notice, before, let's say 30 days notice before they, they would um, allow you to withdraw your, your shares or your deposits. Okay? Um, and in fact, one commentator points out that for many years, savings and loan associations have made the proud boast that every withdrawal paid upon demand or some similar statement. So um, it, it's certainly true, as Timberlake claims, that shareholders had to trade their share accounts in for currency or, or, or bank drafts, okay? Um, but they got them at par and on demand. Okay? And then they were, they were able to, to, to spend them on goods and services. So there were really no difference in the savings accounts, let's put it that way, okay? Rothbard was simply recognizing um, that a legal technicality shouldn't stand in the way of identifying something as money when essentially it functioned as money when essentially your share account was, uh, allowed you to withdraw readily spendable dollars. Okay. And they were just as readily spendable as dollars that were held in, in, in commercial bank savings deposits, okay. which, by the way, Timberlake does include in the money supply. Okay. In, in his definition of the money supply, he, um, he includes a savings deposits offered by commercial banks, which are the same thing. Okay. All right, now, secondly, um, Regarding this point, he does not object to Rothbard's inclusion of the savings deposits of mutual savings banks in the money supply, okay? Although mutual savings banks are also owned by their, were owned by their depositors. So he, he, doesn't, he doesn't object to that. And they're identical in their function to savings and loan associations and were also uh, technically mutually owned by their depositors. But he doesn't object to, to, to people uh, to, to, inclu uh, to including the, the, their um, savings deposits, okay, that people could withdraw on demand, though subject to uh, a never enforced 30-day notice in the same way. Okay. So why, why then does uh, Timberlake insist so vehemently on treating the liabilities of these two institutions, both of which are supposedly um, owned by their shareholders, so differently? Okay. Well, it goes back to Friedman and Schwartz. Friedman and Schwartz, in their book, their great book, um, excluded the share accounts of savings and loans and of credit unions from their definition of the money supply on the grounds that these institutions are technically not banks, as defined in accordance with the definition of banks agreed upon by the federal bank supervisory agencies. Okay. Um, since, quote, holders of funds in these <coughs> institutions are, for the most part, technically shareholders, not depositors. Well, who cares that they're technically shareholders? And who cares what, what some bank regulatory agency 
says. This is just simple uh, you know, legalism, substituting for economic analysis. Okay? These um, items are part of the money supply precisely because people can interchange them at par on demand for checking accounts or for cash. Okay. So this brings us to the, to the net policy reserves of life insurance companies. Okay. When people have um, certain life insurance types of life insurance policies, they are permitted to borrow, to take an instant loan okay, against these whole life insurance policies, okay, up to a certain percentage. Um, and Rothbard then included those net policy reserves, the extent to which people could withdraw money from their um, insurance policies okay, on demand. Now, that's controversial. Um, um, I don't believe it, it belongs in the money supply. Um, and even it, it, when Murray Rothbard and I in the 1980s um, came up with um, what we call the true money supply, we, we cooperated uh, in, in coming up with a sort of an Austrian definition of the money supply, um, we, we left out net policy reserves. Okay. In any case, though, this is not Rothbard trying to contrive some sort of, of a, a, law, a broader measure of the money supply so as to make the 1920s appear as if it was more inflationary than it really was. Because if you look back in the 1960s and 70s and look at mainstream Keynesian textbooks okay, on money and banking, um, you'll find that many of the writers included these as part of the money supply or as a very liquid asset that was very, very nearly money. For example, a book by Walter Haynes characterized insurance companies as savings institutions okay, and noted that these savings can be withdrawn at any time simply by allowing the policy to lapse, a feature that marks them as a near money okay, on a par with savings accounts. So here's one writer that put them on a par with savings accounts. Um, M.L. Burstein maintained that the cash value of a life insurance policy offered, quote, readily com ready convertibility into cash was almost as liquid as a mattress full of currency. So he's saying it's almost like currency, because you can immediately withdraw it. Uh, and um, satisfied the precautionary motive for holding liquid assets no less than savings and loan accounts and savings bonds. Um, Albert, ha Albert Hart and Peter Kennan included the net cash values of life insurance in the broadest class of financial assets possessing the attribute of moneyness. Okay, so the Keynesians ap 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 approach uh, their definition of the money supply a little differently than the Austrians. They, they believe that liquidity determines if something is part of the money supply, how easy it is to get cash for it. And so in the broadest um, um, aggregate or monetary aggregate, as I said, Hart and Kennan include the um, net cash values of life insurance. Finally, Thomas Cargill, um, who I believe is was, was, was a monetarist, ranked, ranked uh, these... Um, net cash values or net surrender values of, of, of life insurance policies. He ranked them on a liquidity spectrum, immediately below certificates of deposit, which are included in, in the current M3 definition of the money supply. So whether Rothbard was right or wrong in including these, um, he, cer he certainly was in good company. There were other, uh, other economists with other definitions of the money supply that were including the um, uh, net um, cash reserves of life insurance policies in their um, definitions of money. All right. Well, I went on and I took out these net cash reserves, okay, uh, to, to see how it would affect the, um, how inflationary the 1920s were. And that is the rate at which the money supply increased. And what we find is the following. Yeah, I'll fix that by doing the lights. Right here. <coughs> here we go. Good. Very good. Is that good? No, I, no I'm going to write something. Don't worry. This is that, I just turned the thing over. Um, what I wanted to... Okay, so here's, here's what, what I found when I recalculated um, Rothbard's money supply. Okay? Leaving out net cash... Um, the net cash value of life insurance policies. Okay, so let's call it the, the um, RM for Rothbard's money supply. And the percent 
increase in Rothbard's money supply. Did I touch something that caused it to? Yeah. Yep, sorry. Okay. All right. Um, it turns out that from 1921 to 1928, according to Rothbard, his money supply increased by 61%. Now, on a yearly basis, that's 8.1% per year. Okay. Now, recalculating Rothbard's money supply and leaving out the policy, the net policy reserves, I found that instead of 61%, the overall increase was 55%, which yields a 7.3% per year change in the money supply. Still a tremendous rate of, infla of, of inflation of the money supply. Okay? It, it, it reduces it marginally. Okay? It doesn't um, that that 7.3 percent can just as easily set off uh, the Austrian business cycle theory, since it's flowing through 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 the um, credit credit markets as the banks inject new money into the economy. Okay, J just as easily as an 8.1 percent. Okay, I, I think it's a you know a, min a minimal difference. Okay. Now, Rothbard goes on, um, or I'm sorry, Timberlake goes on to criticize Rothbard for um, ignorance of the flawed institutional framework within which the gold standard and the central bank <laughs> generated money, okay, and also mismeasurement of the central bank's monetary data. Um, in fact, Rothbard was, was quite aware that the U.S. Money, monetary regime of the 1920s and 1930s was not a genuine gold standard. Okay, that in fact it was a, 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 a watered down version of the gold standard. It was what we might call the uh, uh, a form of the gold exchange standard. Okay, um, it was in fact a hybrid system in which uh, it wasn't merely market forces. Okay, that is the inflow of gold to and f from abroad and, 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 and through the balance of payments to abroad that determine the money supply. Okay, but the, the, the Fed, in fact, possessed substantial power to manipulate the money supply regardless of what was happening to the, to the um, stock of gold in the economy. Okay, by, by pyramiding paper reserves, okay, both notes and deposits, um, a, a t on top of the stock of gold reserves. So, in fact, Rothbard went much further than Timberlake in, in <clears throat> completely separating those factors affecting the money supply that were subject to the Fed control and those factors that were not subject to the Fed control, for example, changes in, in the gold stock. Okay? So, now what Timberlake does is the following. He says, well, um, the Fed was actually deflationary during the 1920s. The Fed was, was, was attempting to be deflationary during the 1920s. And, and he, he arrives at this by the following. He says, look, we have the monetary base which under the gold standard includes the amount of currency in circulation okay, plus reserves, okay, which include gold as well as Fed notes. Okay, banks hold both gold and Fed notes as reserves. Okay, so that's known as the monetary base. And what Timberlake then does is to say, well, the Fed does not control the gold supply. Okay? The, the gold supply is determined by the balance of payments, which is determined by market forces. So, he subtracts from this the gold stock. Um, and he calls, actually I should do that on the next line. Um, he calls this the net Fed, what the Fed can control. The Fed can control, let me just cross that out. The Fed can control currency plus reserves minus the gold stock. So it can, can, can um, control the paper currency in circulation and the, 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 the paper reserves that banks hold. They okay. can't control gold reserves because they um, are, are determined, as I said, by the balance of payments. Now, he says, if we look at what he calls the net Fed, okay, what the part of the money supply or the base of the money supply that it can, it can control, um, he says that, in fact, this aggregate from 1921 to 1929 
fell by 8% per year. So, not only was the 1920s not an inflationary decade, now this is not the money supply, the money supply was going up, but not uh, according to the monetarists, but not at a very great rate, not at the rate that Rothbard had claimed. But not only was it not an inflationary decade, the Fed itself was trying to deflate the money supply, according to, um, according, according to uh, Timberlake. Okay? It was only the uncontrolled gold stock that continued to, to, to cause the money supply to um, increase. Okay. Um, because gold was flowing into the U.S., Well, it is true that the gold stock is uncontrolled by the Fed, but Rothbard points out that there are other factors that are uncontrolled by the Fed. For example, the currency in circulation isn't controlled by the Fed. People can take currency in circulation and, uh, that they're holding and deposit in the banks, and that becomes part of bank reserves, which then would cause uh, a multiple increase in checking account money. So whenever anyone puts a dollar, let's say today, in, in, into, into the banking system, you cause... Um, at the limit, an increase in checking account money by $10. On the other hand, if at Christmas you, you want more cash because you're going you're to buy small gifts and so on, and you withdraw, and this does happen, by the way, uh, to a large, uh, uh, to, in a very lo large way during the Christmas season, if you withdraw you know, $1,000 from your checking account, um, that would cause a decrease, uh, all other things equal, in the money supply by $10,000. Okay? So, currency which is the currency in circulation, is controlled by the, um, uh, by, not by the Fed, but by the public, right? So he, he points out that, that um, currency in circulation, or I pointed out the currency in circulation, it really is improperly uh, uh, in, in Timberlake's net, net Fed aggregate, okay? Because it's not controlled by the Fed, it's controlled by the banking public, all right? Um, that's not all, okay? Um, under the prevailing policy regime of the 1920s, the banks themselves could reduce the amount of bank reserves, and that's the quantity of money in existence, by deliberately reducing their indebtedness to the Fed. In other words, if they wanted to borrow from the Fed, the Fed kept the, um, the discount rate, the rate at which it loans to banks at a very low level, uh, a, a level that was below the market level. So when banks came and borrowed okay, at that rate, they could then <coughs> lend at a higher rate, and that would expand the money supply. So the Fed could control that. By raising the interest rate, the Fed could, could restrict borrowing from itself and therefore could control these borrowed reserves and the increase in the money supply that, that resulted from them. However, on the other hand, the banks themselves had the right to pay back these loans at any time and, or, or let them lapse, not, not renew them. And when they paid back the loans, that decreased the money supply. Now, the paying back of the loans, according to Rothbard, and I think he's correct here, is controlled by, not by the Fed, but by the banks. So according to Rothbard, what we're going to call the controlled factors, okay, the Fed's controlled reserves, okay, let's call them the control, Fed's controlled reserves. This is Rothbard's um, equation. You have to subtract from the monetary base so let's start the monetary base, which is um, currency plus reserves. Not only the gold stock, because that's not controlled by the Fed, you also have to control, uh, I'm sorry, uh, subtract currency, because that's not controlled by the Fed. It's a little straighter here. And finally, you have to control or, or um, subtract net bills repaid. So when, 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 when banks pay back their um, loans from the Fed, that reduces the amount of reserves they hold, and that re reduces the money supply. So the Fed contr controls then only a, a, a portion of the reserves of the banks, okay? that portion that they can inject into, into the system through open market operations by going out and buying, by creating money and buying various um, government securities and so on. So if we readjust the factors that can be controlled by the Fed, okay, we find, according to Rothbard, the following. The 
um, in, in, um, contra in, in, in contradiction of what Timberlake's telling us here, that, that there's, the Fed was deflationary or trying to be deflationary during the 1920s, Rothbard points out that the Fed increased controlled reserves, the reserves they could control by 18% per year. So the Fed was attempting to inflate the money supply during this period. Okay. Which brings us to the 1930s. It was claimed by Timberlake that there was an intention uh, on the part of the Fed to deflate the money supply. Okay. And its intention is reflected, according to him, by what is happening, the rate at which the net Fed is changing. And um, he claimed that the Fed was... Oh, before I actually get to that, I did want to make one more point. Um, Timberlake makes the point that the Fed wanted to help Great Britain. Great Britain was losing gold. It went back onto the gold standard at an overvalued par. Okay? It had inflated greatly during World War I to pay for World War I to finance the war, and therefore had in, in, increased the money supply uh, and, and prices. What it tried to do to reestablish its position as the financial center of, 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 of Europe and of, of the industrial world, it, it tried to go back onto the gold standard at the pre-war par. Okay. Now, that meant that in order to do that, it had to reduce prices by at least 10% or so. Because otherwise, prices would be very high in terms of, of gold in the rest of the world. You, the, um, particularly the coal unions in Great Britain would not take wage cuts. So it was very difficult to, to deflate the, the money supply in Great Britain. So the um, president of, of the uh, Bank of England um, asked the, the, uh, the, the pre president uh, strong of the New York Federal Reserve Bank to help Great Britain. Okay? Now, the New York Federal Reserve Bank was, was the most powerful bank in the system at the time. Okay? And, and so there was an agreement that, that the, the, the U.S. would change its monetary policy in a way that would stop Britain from losing gold. Okay? Why would Britain lose gold at, at such a, 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 by going back on to the gold standard at an overvalued par? Precisely because its prices were so high relative to the rest of the world that its exports um, were, were low or were falling and its imports were high. So it had a balance of payments deficit and it was losing gold. Okay. So the U.S. wanted to help Britain reverse that loss of gold. So what did the U.S. do? Okay. Somehow Timberlake thinks that the Fed deflated to help Great Britain, but it's the opposite. Theoretically, the way you help a country that's losing gold is to raise your own prices so that relative to their prices. So that cuts down on on imports from the United States and it increases exports from Britain to the United States as our prices go up. And if that was the Fed's intention, and in fact, it operated on controlled reserves to bring about that intention. Okay. And, and, and you know, so, so, so it, it's Timberlake himself who's contradicting himself by saying the Fed wanted to help Great Britain, wanted to stem its balance of payments deficit, but intentionally deflated or try to deflate during the 1920s. Well, that wasn't the case at all. Okay? It did want to help Great Britain, correct, but in fact it inflated. Okay? That was its intention. Another monetarist named Kenneth Weyer, who actually wrote a pretty good book on monetary and fiscal policy, he wrote the following. He says, Great Britain was calling for help in 1924, and a Benjamin Strong, president of the New York Fed, heard the call. Expansionary monetary policy in the U.S. would drive prices up and interest rates down in this country so that uh, money would flow into Great Britain to, uh, in search of higher interest rates, um, which would tend to send gold flowing towards Great Britain where prices were lower and interest rates were higher. These changes would help Americans' ally build up the gold stock. Um, there can be no question that the Fed would not have moved when it did were it not for concern of the gold standard and the plight of Great Britain. By 1927, the stagnant British economy needed help from the United States and the rest of Europe. 
Just as had been, as had been the case in 1924, monetary policy was shifted to an expansionary program in order to aid Great Britain's struggles to return to the gold standard, unquote. Okay? And that's by a monetarist. Okay. So um, Rothbard's reinterpretation of the monetary data and what the Fed could and could not control really also cuts against Timberlake's claim that the Fed, quote, monetarily starved the country into the worst economic crisis it has ever experienced. Okay, that's, that's Timberlake's quote. Okay, on the contrary, if we look at the factors that were controlled by the Fed, okay, they continue to, to exercise a really highly inflationary impact on bank reserves and the money supply. From 1929 to 1932, this is precisely the period during which um, Friedman and Schwartz claimed that there was a great contraction of the money supply that was caused by the Fed. Yes, there was a contraction of the money supply, but it was not caused by the Fed, as I'll show you. It was caused by uncontrolled factors. It was caused by people pulling their currency out of the banks because they were fearful the banks would collapse and their savings accounts and, and checking accounts would disappear. It was caused by foreigners taking um, their investments out of the country and therefore causing gold to flow out of the country. It was caused by the banks themselves increasing their excess reserves, that is, not lending out money when they could have, okay? Instead, holding the money rather than lending it out at interest because they were fearful that the um, lenders would default because of, of, of the depression. So um, if we look at, at some of the um, statistics here, we'll see what, what Rothbard was talking about. Just keep in mind that there was a loss of confidence during this period in the Fed-dominated you know, phony gold standard, okay, both by the public and by foreign investors. Right? So, as I said, we had a decrease in currency, in, uh, we had an increase in currency in circulation. <coughs> Reserves were taken out of the bank. People uh, um, cashed in their, their, their checking accounts, withdrew money from their savings accounts, and so on. And so the banks lost reserves, and they had to reduce the money supply. And as I said, f um, foreign investors took their money out of the country and cashed in dollars for gold and took that out of the country. So the gold stock de declined. And that also caused a decline in the money supply. Okay. And, then, and finally, banks increased their liquid reserves and stopped lending the maximum that they could have uh, under uh, regulations. So let's look at, at the statistics. From the end of 1929 to the end of, 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 uh, of, of December 1929 to the end of December 1931, uh, bank reserves fell from $2.36 billion to $1.96 billion, okay, causing Rothbard's money supply to drop. So the money supply dropped in those years from about $73.52 billion, okay, 1929, uh, and this is in billions, to by 1931, 68 dollars $25 billion. Okay. So that was the end of 1931. And then it also dropped in 1932 and 1933. Um, during 1932, it continued to decline. It fell to 64.72. And um, it fell by another $3 billion in 1933, so it was down to 61.72. Okay, so Rothbard agrees with the monetarists. Okay, there was a collapse in the money supply. Where he disagrees with Timberlake and the monetarists was the causes of this collapse. And it's quite a collapse, quite a decrease in the money supply. Okay. Um, what he points out is that the Fed furiously inflated controlled reserves. In the last 10 months of the year, controlled reserves um, rose by um, over $1 billion, or 76%. That is, in 1933, they increased reserves by 76% in the banking system. Okay. Oh, actually, that was 1932. Uh, the story was the same in 1933. Uh, they increased control reserves by $785 million in one month alone. Okay. But this was defeated by the public and the banks. Okay. And, and, and as I said, the money supply decreased by $3 billion. Now, let me see if I have overall figures here. Uh, in terms of percent. Um, 
The Fed increased um, control reserves by 17% from 1929 to 1931. Okay. So, so you had that increase by 17%. And as I said, in 32 and 33, they continued to in increase um, the um, uh, amount of reserves in the system that they could control. Now, what defeated that? If you go back to this... This equation, okay, the Fed's controlled reserves, even though the Fed was, was increasing the part of the monetary base that it could control through open market operations, banks were paying back their, their borrowings from the Fed because they, had no, they didn't want to, to loan them out. Uh, interest rates were very low. Uh, the borrowers didn't have good credit. So bank reserves were falling for that reason. People were withdrawing currency from the banking system, decreasing their reserves more. And foreigners were taking their um, investments out of the country, and in order to do that, you had to cash in your dollars for gold. So, it was not the Fed that engineered this massive deflation. It was a phony gold standard that was breaking down, that the public had lost confidence in. And that's why the people were simply reclaiming their property, both foreigners and, and, and American citizens. They were reclaiming their property um, from a fractional reserve system that couldn't pay out pay off. Okay. Um, now let me just talk about two, uh, Timberlake's two other points. Okay. Um, and this is where he criticizes both the Treasury policy and the Fed policy. Okay. The first um, criticism uh, is the policy that the Treasury followed of neutralizing or sterilizing the effect of uh, the inflow of gold on bank reserves from late 1936 to 1938. So in other words, when gold flowed into the, um, into the U.S. during this period, during those two years, instead of issuing dollars, okay, as those, uh, uh, to, or, or bank reserves on the basis of, of, of gold, okay, the Fed <laughs> sterilized the gold inflow, which meant that as they bought the gold that came into the country, they sold government securities to the same extent so there was no net effect on the money supply. Now, why would they do that? Okay. Um, the reason why they did that was because, in fact, we weren't even on a gold standard from 1936 to 1938. What had happened was that in 1934, the Roosevelt administration had devalued the dollar. That is, it raised the price of gold uh, from $20.67 to $35, meaning it devalued the dollar by 60% in terms of the amount of gold it contained. It now contained only one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold instead of one twentieth of an ounce of gold. So the price of gold suddenly jumped up in the United States at $35. Well, foreigners aren't stupid. What they did was then they began to send gold to the United States in exchange for this higher price, because this was the highest price of gold um, at the time. Uh, so gold did flow into the United States, but this was no longer money. American citizens weren't, weren't allowed to own gold from 1933 onward. No one could convert dollars into gold. Okay, so gold was a, a, a non-monetized asset or a, a, a demonetized asset by that time. Right? So when the government was purchasing gold, this would have caused a great inflation as they purchased gold. Those new dollars would have found them their, their way into the. Um, banking system in 1936, and it would have increased the money supply. So rather than have that happen, let's say they purchased $1 million of gold. They would then have created $1 million that could have been uh, part, become part of bank reserves and increased the money supply. Well, to offset that, what the Treasury did was when it, 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 it um, purchased the gold and issued the $1 million, it bought back the $1 million by selling government securities to the extent of $1 million. So basically, it neutralized the inflow of gold on the United States. In fact, people at the time called it a golden avalanche. The U.S. There was an avalanche of gold pouring into the U.S. because of this policy of, of Roosevelt of devaluing the dollar, which meant increasing the price of gold in terms of dollars. So gold was more valuable in the United States than elsewhere. You get more dollars for it. Uh, in exchange for which you could then buy American products and so on. So you had this avalanche of gold. And the Treasury properly 
did not allow this to affect the money supply. Okay. So um, from 34 to 36, we had an enormous increase in the money supply as a result of this policy. Uh, the money supply increased at rates of 14% in 1934, 14.8% in 1935, and 11.4% in 1936. Money supply was increasing at double-digit um, figures, okay, or at double-digit rates during this period. And it was in 1936 then that the um, Treasury decided to stop that increase in the money supply by what they called sterilizing or neutral, neutralizing the effect of this gold inflow. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that, let's say even if gold was, were, were still money, okay, according to the currency school, when gold flows in, if you have a fractional reserve system, what's going to happen is that you're gonna, the money supply is going to increase by a multiple of, of gold. So let's say if um, you have $1 of gold flowing in, the money supply could increase by $10. Right? So there's nothing wrong with, even, even if gold was, were money, which it was not, there's nothing wrong with sterilizing um, the extra nine dollars of, 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 of reserves that would have come into existence as a result of gold flowing in. That's the currency school policy. Under a 100% gold standard, when, when, when one dollar worth of gold flows in, the money supply increases by one dollar, period, end of story. But under a fractional reserve system, when one, one dollar flows in, uh, you can have an increase in the money supply up to a maximum of ten dollars if the rate of... Um, the reserve ratio or the uh, uh, um, proportion of, of deposits you have to hold in reserve, if that's 10%, then you could get a money multiplier or a deposit multiplier of 10. Okay. And as, as by, by the way, as, as Hayek pointed out, that when you have a fractional reserve goal, um, banking system, even on a gold standard, when you have a balance of payments inflow, as that money gets, as that, those gold reserves get into the banking system and there's a multi multiplication of, of, of checking account money, that money is loaned out through credit markets, pushes down the interest rate, and brings about the business cycle, an inflation followed by a depression, by distorting the interest rate. So even under fractional reserve gold, gold standard, as, uh, by the way, the currency school saw and as Mises saw, you still get um, the business cycle. Right? Now, it's, it's not as, as severe as it would be under a paper money, but, but it, it still can occur. All right. All right, uh, finally, um, Timberlake objects to the Fed's policy of raising reserve requirements in 1936 and 1937. Okay? The Fed did this because there were a massive amount of excess reserves that the banks did not let, were not lending out. Okay? And they were afraid that once the banks lent out these excess reserves that they had piled up in the 1930s, there would have been a multiple expansion of, of bank deposit money, and as a result, you would have gotten a large inflation of the money supply. Okay? And that's a correct analysis. Okay? But Timberlake advances two criticisms against this policy. First, he says the policy was unnecessary, because even if the excess reserves that existed uh, on the eve of its um, implementation, um, even if they were all fully loaned out by the banks, the inflationary potential was relatively minor. Okay? Timberlake says that the 52% increase in the money supply that would have resulted, would have been a 52% increase in the money supply, he said that was, was only mildly inflationary because the larger money supply would have exceeded the needs of trade of a fully employed economy by 5.6% at 1929 prices which was about 25% higher than the prices prevailing in June of 1936. Now, here's what he's saying. He's saying because prices have fallen so much from 1929 to 1936 um, that there's nothing wrong with the money supply exploding by 52%. Okay? Because that increase in the money supply by, by 52% would simply drive prices up back to their 1929 levels, maybe a little bit beyond that, about 5% beyond that. Okay? And um, that's a good thing. Well, that's just strict, straight um, inflationism. It's saying, or reflationism. It's saying that we can get out of a depression by simply reflating the money supply, by simply creating more paper money and um, restoring the old level of prices, and that will put people back to work and get us get us moving again. 
But all that does is sow the seeds for a further business cycle. Um, so, in a plain language, Timberlake is literally defining away a potential money and price inflation of huge proportions because of its ex he perceives it as expedient in expanding employment and output and extra extricating the economy from a depression. Basically, he wants to inflate the Fed to um, allow the banks to inflate, inflate us out of the, the recession. Okay, he wanted to leave the excess reserves there. As the banks began to loan them out, and the money supply increased, we could, we could inflate our way out of a recession. And, that, of course, that's contrary to the Austrian view, that you have to have adjustments. And some of these adjustments may very well include, as banks collapse and as people pull their currency out of banks, a reduction in the money supply, and therefore prices should be reduced. The second criticism Timberlake has of this policy is that the increase in reserve requirements uh, went way beyond closing off a potential area of recovery for the economy and actually turned it into another recession. Okay, So um, he's claiming that there, the, this policy resulted in a, a deflation of the money supply that brought about another recession within the existing depression. Uh, the U.S. economy was beginning to recover, and he claims that recovery was aborted by Fed's policy. But again, let's look at Timberlake's data. If you look at, at mo the money supply as defined by M2, which is, which is what Timberlake prefers, um, that grew from $43 billion to $45 billion, or by 4.4% um, in the year between June 1936 and June 1937. Okay? That was the year in which the Fed implemented that policy of, of mopping up the excess reserves. Okay? So you didn't have a deflation. You, you had a, a lower rate of inflation, but you certainly didn't have a deflation. Okay, even in the last six months of the period, um, the money supply wasn't deflated. Okay, it um, it increased by a very low rate, slightly below one percent per year. So even from uh, Timberlake's monetarist standpoint, it's really difficult to blame that recession of, of 37, 38 on deflationary Fed policy. Okay, the Fed policy wasn't really deflationary. At most, it, it, it reduced the rate of inflation. At most. Um, in any case, Timberlake's emphasis on fl Fed deflationism as the cause of, of, of this problem um, causes him to ignore a very plausible Austrian explanation of why we had a recession within the Depression. Okay? And recently, a veteran Galloway's book on, uh, called Out of Work, which I highly recommend, um, uses sort of an Austrian approach to explain why the Depression lasted as long as it did. Um, what happened in 1937, which was ignored, was the following. Well, actually, it happened in, uh, initially in 1935. In 1935, the Supreme Court upheld the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. They upheld it as, constitution, as constitutional. This act set up the, N, the National Labor Relations Board, and it put in place... Um, mandatory collective bargaining. So um, if 51% of the members of a bargaining unit, let's say either a firm or a plant, voted for a union, the other 49% were stuck with that union. Even if the higher union wages and benefits caused them to become unemployed, they could not bargain to work for a lower wage. Okay? So mandatory collective bargaining was imposed in 1935. So money wages, not unsurprisingly, jumped by 13.7% in the first three quarters of the year. So during a, during a depression, wages jumped by 13.7%. Okay. This sudden jump in the price of labor far outstripped the, um, the, the increase in, in um, output prices. Okay. So, 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 so now what you had was profit margins were being squeezed tremendously by this increase in the price of labor uh, or wages, which went beyond the increase in, in, in output prices. Uh, what did that cause? Well, according to, the, uh, to Austrians or to any really good neoclassical economists, if you have uh, an increase in, uh, uh, in, in, in costs okay, and no increase in prices or very little increase in prices, that's going to squeeze profit margins. It's going to cause layoffs. And that can explain that. that um, now, more research has to be done there, but, but that can certainly explain the recession. And in fact, if you look at at the monetary data, you find that the large upward spurt in excess reserves, okay, and then the accompanying decrease in the money supply, 
that we um, observe in, in, in Timberlake's data between June 30th and uh, uh, 37 and June 30th, 38. So there was a decrease in mice, but later on. Uh, why would the bank suddenly increase their excess reserves even more? Okay. Well, you're in the middle of, a, of another recession. Businesses aren't doing good. They're not demanding loans, or you're very, very reluctant to, to lend them money because you're fearful that, that they'll uh, fail and, not, and, and, and default on the loan. Okay. So what an Austrian would, would say, looking at these data, is that, in fact, it was the recession caused by the Supreme Court decision that put into place mandatory collective bargaining and caused an increase in wages. Okay. It was that recession that brought about an increase in excess reserves in 37 and 38, okay, after the recession had already begun, because recession was a, uh, had, had, was a 37, 38 recession, um, <coughs> that caused a fall in the money supply. Okay? So uh, banks were increasing their excess reserves, and as you increase your excess reserves, you, you, you decrease the money supply. But that was in reaction to the fact that, that businesses weren't doing well during the recession. So, what's the conclusion? Um, my conclusion, then, is that the Fed's monetary policy, except for brief periods, notably during 1928-29 and 1936-37, okay, when it, when it did turn disinflationist, it didn't really cause a deflation, but it turned disinflationist, or very, very mildly deflationary, okay, it was outside of those two, two short periods, it was consistently inflationist from mid-1921 to the end of the 1930s. Okay. And, I, and I believe, and I think other Austrians um, that follow Rothbard believe, that this inflationism was the cause of the Great Depression and one of the reasons why it was so protracted, because you didn't allow prices to fall to their natural levels and the economy to adjust. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll take any questions on this. Or on, yeah. In Rothbard, he's talking about in 1981. Uh -huh. <coughs> Yeah. What's your guess what those numbers should be? Well, right now, I was looking at it last night because I'm going to talk a little bit about this this afternoon. It would be over $4,000. If you want to want back up by 100% all currency and checking deposits, and forgetting about savings deposits and other components of what the Austrians call the money supply, simply back up 100% currency and checking deposits, you would we have about one point two trillion dollars of currency and checking deposits in our country, uh, in, in the U.S. economy. Uh, and you would divide that by what I believe to be 260 million ounces of gold that, that the, the uh, U.S. government is holding, okay, um, uh, in basically in the New York Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, the quotient of that is $4,000, $4,080 or something like that. Yeah, that would back up both currency and demand deposits. And that would eliminate the uh, downward push on prices and so forth. In fact, there would be now. See, there are pro there are different plans, and we're gonna. I don't want to get. <coughs> we're gonna discuss it, but but the transition to the gold standard can be something that's very difficult because if we suddenly raise the price to four thousand eighty dollars, all the gold in the world, the gold in the rest of the world is selling at three hundred fifty dollars or four hundred dollars would flow into the United States. We'd have a massive inflation, a once and for all massive inflation. Um, so that may, at this point, that may not be the best way to do it. We'll talk about a plan that Mises has, a plan that uh, Hazlitt has, um, and also you might want to supplement the, the gold with silver. But that is, a, we know that the, the gold standard is the goal. That's what we want. But getting there, is, you know, there are going to be problems. Okay. And, and, and a lot, I think more research has to be done now. Back when, 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 the, when the price of gold that you would have needed to back up everything by 100% was lower, was closer to the market price, it would have been easier. But now it's so far away from the market price, it may be very difficult. Yes? Put a review of Great Britain again during that period of 1920. Uh, did any of that change uh, occur when Great Britain was trying to repay the House of Morgan, owned by 1916, had over four billion. Uh, 
was, I don't know when any of this came back. Did, were they trying to do it then, or what? Was that? It was in, more, yeah. In, in, in inflation there? I, I don't know when it was made back. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think that that was a big problem with Great Britain at that point, <laughs> okay? Um, well, I just saw that particular because yeah. the market was so entwined with, with Great Britain. Right, right, lending the money, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. Lend, lending the money, right. That certainly had something to do with, with the balance of payments deficit. I mean, uh, in other words, um, that's one of the reasons why you would, would, would lose gold. Or that's, that's one of the, that's, um, you know, the balance of payments is equal to the balance of trade, the difference between exports and imports, plus the capital account. So if you have to make payments on, on capital account, on the capital account, that's going to add to the deficit if you have a deficit on, uh, the balance of trade. In other words, to pay back on your, your, your capital account, you have to run a surplus. So, they couldn't run a surplus because their prices were so high relative to the rest of the world. Okay, they were buying more from the rest of the world than they were selling to the rest of the world because of their high prices. Okay? So you're a bad place to, 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 to buy from and you're a good place to sell to. And if you're trying to go back on a gold standard um, at uh, an overvalued parity, the gold, you're going to be losing gold. And the U.S. wanted to help Great Britain by raising its own prices. So Timberlake is completely wrong here by saying that, in fact, um, the U.S. was trying to help Great Britain by, de uh, by having the Fed trying to deflate the money supply, okay? And as I, I mentioned, um, Kenneth Weyer, uh, uh, the other monetarist that I, that I cited, uh, pointed this out, that, in fact, inflation was the way that the Fed chose to um, aid Great Britain. Yes? Uh, I've heard Benjamin Strong called a, a traitorous Anglophile, and I'm wondering if there's any I a U.S. interest in his, his move to, to help Britain out. He was a close friend of Montague Norman, uh, the director of the Bank of England. I don't think called him the president. I, I, I said that. I, I believe it's director of the Bank of England. Um, so, and he was an Anglophile. Okay. Now, you're saying did he have any monetary interests? Like, did the U.S. have interest in doing that, or was it just to help out Britain? No, no, oh, did we did we have legitimate interests? No, no. I think I think um, you know, as, as as the ordinary citizens certainly didn't have an interest in helping Britain, Great Britain out. Okay. What Great Britain could have easily done, which they refused to do, was simply to go back to gold at um, a, a, a lower parity. Okay? So in other words, devalue the pound to reflect the fact, devalue the pound by 10% to reflect the fact that prices were 10% higher. Okay? So in other words, raise the gold price, uh, I'm sorry, raise the price of gold in terms of the pound, which means that now each pound would, would contain less gold. They didn't want to do that because it, they thought it would be a loss of prestige. So the U.S. was trying to help them, or, or, or um, um, Benjamin Strong in particular was trying to help the, uh, the British um, reattain their position as sort of a, a financial center. Okay. Yes, Dan. Um, I'm not sure if this question should maybe be held off for the next question. Well, ask it and I'll, you know. Okay. Um, if we recognize that gold historically became a, a monetary standard because of its capacity as a commodity yes. that was interchangeable. <clears throat> and that we had a gold standard and we went off, so now the question is how to return to a commodity right. standard. Is, are the logistical conceptions of gold still, in your opinion, the, the, the winner of all commodity potential currencies in a modern economy? Like, would something like oil or gasoline yeah. be a better bagging system than okay. a um, system? That's something that you can't, you can't predict. You can't predict what the market will choose. Okay? So you're asking me if I'm, if I'm a constructivist from the Hayekian point of view. What I, I do, yeah, I, I am a partial constructivist in the following sense. I think we should go back to what we had before the government moved, uh, moved us to a fiat currency. Okay, before there was an intervention that destroyed the commodity standard. Now, if we go back to gold, and it turns out that gold is so scarce in relation to commodities now because of the tremendous growth that it would be inconvenient to carry, you know, to, for, for small purchases and so on, um, then I think the market would monetize silver, for example, okay, uh, or, or possibly other commodities. But I think gold and silver, I think there's, there's gold and silver would, would tend to win out. 
But what I, for example, Larry White has one, you know, has said, well, well, why not go to a silver standard? Why, why does it have to be gold? Well, we have to be constructivists in reconstructing the commodity standard, which was destroyed by government um, uh, intervention. At that point, then we can let things go. If people want 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 to choose another commodity, that's fine. So, someone who is an advocate of the gold standard, um, gold is simply the commodity that has, over the centuries, uh, emerged from voluntary market actions. So when I say I'm a gold standard advocate, I'm, I'm really a, um, uh, a market money advocate. If, 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 go if gold needs to be supplemented by some other commodity or displaced by it, and uh, the government has nothing to do with that, that process, then I'm all in favor of it. Okay. Guido Holzman, Holzman thinks that silver would um, eventually uh, replace gold. But a, we'll talk about those types of questions because those, those are very important. <laughs> this transition period. Yes. <clears throat> this uh, 1811 court case, Carr versus Carr. Right. Uh, I've told people that's what makes the fractional reserve system sort of a legal. It might be wrong, but it's legal. What, what was the actual decision? Is, is this a British? Uh, uh, Right. Was that a uh, same as putting into a gold bank right. and getting something that you, you put up certain your own right. gold in there? I believe the uh, judge said something like, "No, you didn't have your money to put in right. there in a bag with your name." Right, or right. So it was a loan. It was a loan. If you if you if you had it um, uh, in. Uh, uh, earmarked, and if it was put in a secure, in a, a, a um, what do they call it, a safety deposit box, then they have to have to give you back. They have to keep it there, and they have to give you back the exact same coins. Okay, but if if you have a, a what's called a general deposit warrant, in other words, if you get um, checking account receipts or, or, or bank note receipts for a, a, a fungible commodity like gold, they don't have to give you back the exact same um, property that, that that you deposited. And moreover, you know, in this decision, they went beyond that, I believe, and said that, in fact, uh, it's not actually a bailment. It's a loan. It's a loan to the banks. Okay. Which may right. 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 It strengthened the legality. Uh, by the way, um, two, two, in, two things I, I might bring up. One is um, Grain warehouses for a while used to um, loan out their grain, or at least print up false receipts to grain that, uh, that that farmers had deposited with them, and they would print up these receipts and lend them to speculators, who then would speculate on commodity mar markets, commodity markets with them, and that was ruled to be illegal, even though grain was fungible and the farmers didn't get back the same grain. That was ruled not to be a loan of grain. Okay, that you know that you would have to have. You could have a fraction reserve a grain warehouse, right? As long as they have the grain there when the when 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 a, a, a grain depositor comes in, well then there's no problem. But but they ruled against that. The second um, um, interesting anecdote has to do with an armored car company. This was in the 1880s. Uh, I'm sorry, 1980s. Um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, and I, I cut it out. I don't have it with me. But it turns out armored car companies, I thought they had to deliver the money immediately, but they have warehouses where they just store the money. And they can store money for, you know, a week or whatever before they deliver it to where it's supposed to go. Well, it turns out that one of these armored car companies was loaning this money out. Okay? And they were charged with fraud. Now, how is that different from, from a bank loaning the money out? It, it, it's a bailment. It's a clear bailment. Okay? Now, then you might argue, uh, you know, following this case, that, well, the bags are marked with the, um, with, 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 with the, the uh, I don't want to call them the depositor, but the uh, bailer's name. So the store that gives the armored car the, the money, that, that pays the armored car company to deliver the money. Um, you know, the money is closed up in a bag and so on, so it's clearly not a loan. All right, maybe that argument can be made, but it's, it's extremely close to what banks initially did, right, when they began to loan out their depositor's money. Yes. Uh, 
Right. And Mises, you know, has secondary media. Yes. To what extent do you buy into that, that spectrum idea? That there isn't a clear, these ones are in, these are out, you're sort of judging and... Uh, okay, I, I think that theoretically we can determine what should be in and what should be out, but when we apply the theory to determining what items should be in and out, as, as Rothbard tried to do, there's going to be a fuzzy line. Okay, there's going to be a gray area. Are net cash reserves of, of um, insurance companies, are they in fact um, part of the money supply or not? I would say no. Rothbard said yes. Um, so you, you're going to have some gray areas. Certainly, um, we have uh, anything that is interchangeable um, at par and um, on demand and is guaranteed through the FDIC, which is backed up by the Fed, I would say has to be included. Okay, so you have to include savings deposits. Um, you have to include... Um, go, uh, government deposits, for example, and, and, and so on. All right. uh, whether you should include other, other you know, because people know, look, when people put their money in, in, in a bank or when they deposit their money, they, all they care about is that FDIC sign. Everyone trusts that they'll immediately get that money, they'll be able to withdraw that money. Okay? <coughs> and um, so I think that you have to look at the institutional features. To what extent do they, do they, um, reflect the theoretical uh, um, definition of, of, of the medium of exchange. Okay. The, the other day when you were talking about savings bank, you said um, that they should be included, especially you know, since we have ATMs, and it's very yeah. easy to get the cash. Yeah. So is there something significant like distance to paper or no, spectrum of liquidity? Or? Um, well, the ATM just make it eat more convenient to get it out, but but let's say someone has gold or, or, or cash and they bury it and they have a vacation house, um, you know, up in Maine, and they bury it under the floorboards there. It's very, very inconvenient to go get that, but I would say it's still part of the money supply, right? So, because some, some people say, well, you know, you can't really pay with your, in the old days when we had passbook savings accounts, I guess you still have them. You can't walk into a store and give them the passbook savings account and somehow transfer the credits on that to them. No, but you can go to the bank next door or down the street, okay, and and and, and just show them the passbook and, and you know and get and get withdraw money from the from the savings account. How's that different from from flying up to Maine to get the money for, that, that's hidden under floorboards? So I don't think it's necessarily just convenience. Um, but did you mean proximity to your money, or did you mean pro closeness between the various items? Yeah, no, no, I think that I, I don't think that the convenience issue co comes in because because people can you look you can own two automobiles and one you again you leave at you know at, at your vacation house or something. I mean, you you own it in any in any in any sense is that sort of less of an automobile to you than the one that you have right here? No. You according to your margin utility, you have allocated it to a different area of your property. I, I, you know, I think the same thing is true with, with money. You're allocating your money balances in a way that maximizes your utility. Okay. On a gold standard, we wouldn't have a lot of these problems. Okay. Because you would have simply gold coins and you would have fully backed checking account, um, checking account deposits or checking deposits. Okay, any other questions? I think we can stop here. Thank you.